Good afternoon and welcome. I'm uh, Rena Agarwal, the Robert E. McDonough Professor of Finance here at Georgetown University and the founding director of the Georgetown Center for Financial Markets and Policy. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for the center's virtual FMQ series on the SEC proposal on securities lending. Uh, FMQ, for those of you who haven't attended it in the past, stands for Financial Markets Quality conference that we host every year in the fall. And, uh, and it's popularly now known as FMQ and has become quite a must, event, uh, must attend event uh, in the fall. So, so this year, the focus of FMQ was the transformation of global financial markets. Financial markets are undergoing transformational change. There's focus on uh, environmental and social issues the growing role of digital assets, the role of fintech, the rise of uh, SPACs, direct listings, in addition to traditional IPOs, the rise and uh, access to retail investors. So th there's just been lots going on and even kind of the bread and butter issues related to uh, market structure. Uh, so many of them are on the table. And all of these are getting the attention of both market participants and also policymakers. So we at the McDonough School of Business, where the Center for Financial Markets and Policy is housed, uh, our objective is to provide thought leadership for global finance. And when we really believe in excellence in research to impact practice and policy. So here at the center and at the Georgetown McDonough School of Business, we conduct original research, uh, unbiased research. We convene, just like today, we have convened this uh, extremely uh, distinguished group of panelists whom I'm most grateful to. And so we are able to bring market participants, regulators, policymakers, corporate leaders, uh, to, to have a discussion on the most critical issues. And, and we also provide opportunities for students. Since our founding in 2000 and after the 2008 crisis, the issues that we have focused on have shifted, have moved, right? In the early days, it was Dodd-Frank and SIPIs and so on. Today, we are very focused certainly on financial markets and regulation but also as they apply to fintech and digital assets. Uh, ESG disclosure is another main area that we are focused on. So today we are delighted to continue our big FMQ conference with uh, a virtual series. And uh, the focus today is on securities lending. And as this group knows, there are a number of proposals being considered uh, by the SEC. And, uh, and this is an, certainly an area that our faculty have a lot of uh, expertise on. And uh, uh, you'll notice that some of the work that is being cited in these proposals, especially around securities lending and proxy voting and NPX and all of that, uh, it's citing our work uh, quite extensively. Uh, you know, I, I myself have done uh, a lot of writing in that area on corporate governance and voting and uh, what happens around the record date and SEC lending. Uh, and uh, and Jim, uh, Professor Jim Angel, or uh, my colleague here, he's uh, been doing, uh, he's focused on these issues for decades now. And uh, so I invite you to learn more about the center and the activities of the center by visiting our website and uh, going to our uh, Twitter handle. But uh, with that, I'm gonna hand it over to Jim Angel. Jim, uh, take it away. And I wanna thank everyone for joining us today. Uh, Why, well, thank you, Rena. And I wanna also extend a welcome to everyone here. We have an amazing panel to talk about this uh, new proposal from our Securities and Exchange Commission. Uh, we have uh, Laura Klimple from uh, DTCC, Howard Meyerson from Financial Information Forum, Josh Galper from Finadium, and Matt Cohen from Provable Markets. We'll come back to them in a moment, but uh, first I want to give you a real quick primer on the new proposal, just in case you haven't read all 184 pages. The, uh, and I want to make sure everybody's real quick up to speed on securities lending. As you know, if you're gonna sell short, 
you need to borrow the shares. On trade date, you're required to locate the shares, make sure you actually can borrow them, but the actual borrow takes place on T plus two, the normal settlement date. Now, in order to borrow the shares, you have to put up collateral, typically 102% of the market value, and that gets adjusted every single day. The actual price for borrowing shares, the rent you pay, is often negotiated as something we call a rebate. The basic idea is whoever's sitting on the collateral has the ability to earn interest on that, and typically they would rebate some of that interest to the borrower. But if you got a really hard to borrow share, you may have a negative rebate. Now, most liquid stocks are pretty easy to borrow, but we call those general collateral. But the hard to borrow stocks, the so-called specials, can be quite costly. Now, securities lending is actually an over-the-counter market. There's no central stock exchange yet for SEC lending. But the NYSC actually used to have a special post just for securities lending. But back during the Great Depression, uh, people weren't very happy with short selling. So the NYSE basically kicked them out. Now, who are the big players? Where, where are these shares coming from that people are borrowing? Well, the big institutions, big mutual funds, pension funds, love to lend out their shares because they earn rent on them. And typically they do this for their custodians. You know, the big custody banks that actually hold the shares for the institutions, they often act as what we call agent lenders. Brokers can also lend out their own customer shares under some very strict rules from the Securities and Exchange Commission. Under the customer protection rule, it's, there are many hoops you have to jump through, especially to loan out so-called fully paid shares where nobody's borrowed against the margin account. Now, prime brokers are often the ones arranging the borrows for their customers who want to go short. So what is the SEC up to? Well, back in 2010, remember Dodd-Frank long, long ago in a galaxy far away? Well, section 984 told the SEC, give us rules to increase the transparency in securities lending. And the SEC was given a two year deadline. It's now 2021. Um, the SEC has finally issued their 184 page proposal to give us a new rule 10C1. And basically the idea here is for a ticker time, excuse me, a ticker tape in SEC lending. So the idea is security loans and their modifications are to be reported to FINRA within 15 minutes. And FINRA is to make it available to the public as soon as practicable. Other data, like how many securities you have to loan, how many available for lending, that's gonna be reported once a day. Now, the uh, comments are gonna be due January 7th. There's only a 30 day comment period here. So if you wanna get your comments into the SEC, um, Better start writing them now. Now, what will be in this ticker? Well, obviously the security name and the ticker symbol for the security there, you know, time and data loan, a lot of the stuff that you would expect, you know, what the rates are, the what kind of collateral, a uh, little bit about the broker type, that'll be made public as soon as practicable. But the regulators are also gonna collect additional data that won't be made public. For example, the legal names of the parties to the loan, whether or not the loan is gonna close out a fail or not. So that's some of the regulatory data that they'll be collecting as well. But remember, comments are due in just a couple of weeks, so you don't wanna miss the deadline. Although the SEC does have a history of extending deadlines and of accepting comments after the deadline. Now, with that, I'd like to uh, stop my share. And <clears throat> now uh, we'll introduce our illustrious panelists in uh, a lot more detail. And uh, you know, we are really blessed here with people with amazing industry experience and knowledge. 
And so I'm just going to go from left to right on my screen. I see Laura Klimple is up first. So Laura, tell us what you do at DTCC and all the cool things they have with their new SFT product. Sure. Thanks, Jim. Thanks for having me. Um, so my name is Laura Klimple. I work for the Depository Trust and Clearing Corporation. I am the general manager of the Fixed Income Clearing Corporation, which uh, novates, clears, and settles U.S. government securities transactions, cash, and financing transactions. I'm also the head of business development for our SIFMU businesses, which are our three clearing agency businesses, FICC, NSCC that clears and settles equities, as well as the Depository Trust Company. Uh, so that's generally my role, um, and it's with my business development hat on that I'm, I'm here to speak to you about um, our uh, new proposed service, which we call the SFT service or Securities Financing Transaction Service. So this is a new service that we have been, that has been in the works for quite some time. And it is going to be uh, uh, rolled out under our NSCC or National Securities Clearing Corporation um, clearing house. And the purpose of it is to provide novation, clearance, and settlement services for equity securities lending transactions. Um, it has been designed to be very capital efficient, um, to create opportunities for borrowers and lenders to achieve balance sheet netting opportunities and capital efficiency opportunities that are very difficult, arguably impossible to recreate in the bilateral world. We see central clearing as a, a key way to create those efficiencies for market participants. And in doing so, give them increased capacity to transact with each other, which is the primary incentive to migrate voluntarily into one of these clearing services. Um, in addition to um, offering capital efficiency opportunities to market participants, it's also being designed to help lenders to be able to transact with a broader array of borrowers than they may be able to transact with in the bilateral world, specifically because the trades are going to be novated to a central counterparty, the central counterparty here, NSCC, is going to guarantee settlement to both sides of the trade. So as long as the trade is bound for clearing and novates, the CCP is going to backstop and guarantee settlement. And that may offer lenders uh, the ability to lend to a wider array of borrowers who may not, in the bilateral world, have the credit worthiness that they need to, uh, to face off against those, those lenders bilaterally. Uh, the product's also been designed to um, uh, to eliminate some operational pain points that have been challenges for the industry over the years, um, such as uh, agent, agent lender disclosure. So in the bilateral world, there's a requirement for borrowers um, after the trade is executed overnight the next day to receive information on who the beneficial owners are that they borrowed the shares from. The trade's novated to a central counterparty everybody knows that central counterparty. So the idea of having to do after the fact disclosures of who the beneficial owner lenders are goes away. There's also other operational efficiencies that central, central counterparty um, clearing and settlement can provide such, such as eliminating monthly billing in the bilateral stock loan world, um, bills are settled between counterparties, you know, sometimes at the end of the month in the CCP, uh, rate or rebate, as you talk about, is going to clean up or be settled between the counterparties um, on a daily basis. So the idea of having to wait till the end of the month to reconcile um, how much, uh, what kind of amounts are owed between the counterparties, that all dissipates and that friction goes away in clearing. So, you know, those are some of the reasons that we are, are rolling it out. Um, we want to offer these efficiencies to the market because, you know, we believe in the value of central clearing in terms of the risk management and the stability that it provides to a market, especially in times of stress. So we are looking to uh, offer these efficiencies, capital, balance sheets, operational efficiencies to try to entice uh, participants, particularly the buy side, who we think have been underserved in clearing to date, especially in SEC lending, to try to bring them into central clearing to be able to, uh, to make that market safer. Why, uh, thank you, Laura. Uh, next on my screen is Howard Meyerson from Financial Information Forward Forum. Take it away, Howard. Thanks, Jim. Uh, first thing I want to say is uh, thanks for inviting me to participate on the panel. 
Um, you know, any time that we can uh, promote dialogue between the industry and the universities, that's a great thing. And I'm always happy to uh, participate in anything like that. Um, it, it, so I'll start, give a little background on Financial Information Forum. We're known as FIF. We are an industry association for broker dealers stock and option exchanges, and technology vendors in the securities industry. The areas that we focus on are implementation, operations, technology, compliance, and regulatory reporting. Unlike uh, my fellow panelists, I'm, I'm not an expert in stock lending, uh, but FIF puts a lot of focus on regulatory reporting. So consolidated audit trail, Rule SEC Rule 605 for order execution reporting, SEC Rule 606 for order routing, uh, short interest reporting, EB, electronic blue sheets, large option position reporting, trace for reporting bonds, uh, TRF and ORF for reporting equity. So as you can see, there are no shortages of reporting systems. And from our perspective, this is another reporting system so the way that we look at it is like any other, the way we look at any other reporting system, uh, what are the transaction workflows? Are firms executing transactions manually? Or is it automated? Are they using uh, centralized third-party uh, execution systems? What data are firms re recording? What, uh, what, firms, what data do they have available relative to the data that has to be reported? And what are the, what are the, where are the gaps and what are the challenges in interpreting the data elements that have to be reported, like um, available to lend, that is generating a lot of questions. And now is the time to get these things defined because we see in other rules, whether it's CAD or 606, or if these things don't get defined now, it's, it can be too late because uh, someone from the SEC has said, uh, you know, the rule is the rule. So once it's adopted, there's much less ability to, to make changes. So now is the time that firms really should be focused on the rule and what's in it and, and making sure that you provide comments. Thank you. Uh, next, we have uh, Josh Galper from Finadium. Thank you, Jim. And thanks very much for having me here today. I'm Josh Galper. I'm managing principal of Finadium. We are a consultancy with a research subscription offering. So we do two things principally. Uh, the first is in our research program, uh, we conduct independent surveys of the securities finance, collateral and derivatives markets. So we're talking to market participants. Uh, we also do regulatory and product analyses. On our consulting side, uh, we're frequently advisors to large pension plans and mutual funds in securities lending. So we're primary consumers of securities lending data we analyze the securities lending programs of beneficial owners, both from a qualitative and quantitative point of view. Um, this proposal in particular from the SEC is of direct interest to our firm. Uh, it speaks to pretty much all that we do on a daily basis. Uh, and I think it um, has potential and also some uh, interesting challenges that I look forward to discussing here today. Thank you, Josh. And last but not least, we have uh, Matt Cohen from uh, Provable Markets. And uh, I understand you have a uh, really new product that is uh, going to be uh, you know, very useful in this marketplace. Yes, uh, thank you, Jim. Uh, thanks for having us. And uh, yes, uh, happy to be here and uh, along with the other participants. Um, so Matthew Cohen, I'm CEO of Provable Markets. Uh, I was a former SEC lending and derivatives trader for about 15 years. Um, I joined Provable Markets about a year and a half ago. Um, prior to that, Provable Markets was founded in late 2020. Um, we recently received our FINRA membership and our registration with the SEC to operate an ATS uh, in the financing space. So within that, we do securities lending, uh, security-based swaps, and financing-based options trading, um, trying to kind of unify this market, reduce barriers to entry, um, and kind of pick away at some of the pain points that we've seen in the past. Um, and so we have a, an amazing engineering team and our firm was founded in late 2018 um, with our technology, our improvable labs, uh, focusing on cryptography. So not blockchain and not cryptocurrency, but cryptography and different ways where we can use um, our, our computer science uh, power, if you will, um, to, to help move the industry forward. So 
Um, Laura touched on a lot of things with SFT. We are a partner with DTC on that in, in what we're called an approved submitter. Um, I like to consider it more like an exchange layer than anything else. So we sit atop DTC and all participants in the securities lending market um, can meet on our platform. And what we do, unlike the traditional kind of way things worked, where Laura mentioned monthly billing and T plus one reconciliation, it's more like a cash equity or options exchange. So all the details of the trade need to get matched by me as the ATS first, and then routed down to DTC. So I won't reiterate the operational improvements that come from that, but we think we can use that to create much more efficiency. And that leads to the ability for newer, maybe smaller market participants, you know, the buy side, like Laura mentioned and others um, to really get access to this market and, you know, we're a firm that believes strongly in market structure and being thoughtful about how we do that. And so, you know, we have a lot of green space as a new entrant, um, and we're very happy to be partnered with the DTC on this. As I think we can we can make significant change by really leveraging our ability and DTC's ability to strengthen market structure. And we're we're interested, obviously, in this new rule and how it affects things and um, how it can maybe help and hinder uh, in certain ways. So, looking forward to the discussion. Thank you. Now, the first question to ask in any regulatory endeavor is what problem are they trying to solve? What is their regulatory objective? Who'd like to uh, take this one? I can jump in, Jim. Uh, so from my vantage point, um, the SEC is looking to acquire data for itself on the securities lending market. I think that's a, a very legitimate ask. Uh, the securities lending market typically is not uh, the most transparent. It's not as opaque as I would, I think that the SEC has made it out to be, but uh, also it's a legitimate request for regulators to want data. The SEC is also saying that they want to provide data to the public for a variety of purposes. Uh, most I'll disagree with in the current form of the regulation, which I don't know if you want to get into quite yet, um, but it's meant to be transparency across the board for a market where transparency is readily available for large institutional players, but not at all really for retail uh, participants or uh, much smaller institutional firms. Thank you. And uh, how will this actually, oh, do any of the other panelists wanna chime in? If you suit, just, just jump in. Yeah, I think I'll just you know jump on Josh's comments. I think obviously there's been a lot of focus on this market in the past year and, and the swaps market, but with GME and um, there's some rightful uh, concerns about what's available information wise for certain investors and not for others. Um, I, I kind of agree with Josh that opacity is not necessarily the biggest problem, um, but it, it can be a hurdle for some. Um, but I think the goal of the rule is to, to really get what is you know a mixed amount of information and get it as tight as possible and also give the regulators what they need. I think that's at least a targeted goal. Um, we, can, we can probably debate later on, on what things will be more impactful than others there. But um, I really think you know hopefully this clears up, but also gives better access points to the overall market with more accurate information. I'll just add one other factor, which is that, as you had mentioned in the introduction, Jim, the, SE, the SEC was directed back in, in Dodd-Frank to adopt rulemaking in this area. So they are required to do that. And I think the only other thing I would add, Jim, is that this is a, this is a global trend you know, that we have observed. This isn't the first disclosure requirement for, for you know, this type of financing transaction we saw, although there's some key differences, you know, between this and the SFTR uh, disclosure requirements that we, we saw come out in Europe. Um, you know, this is a global trend for regulators to be looking for this, this type of additional um, disclosure regarding these types of financing transactions. And what kind of differences are you seeing between this proposal and SFTR? Well, you know, I'm sure Josh and others can jump in here, but I think one of the, the key, or key differences that I've observed in looking at the proposal is the 15 minute requirement. I don't think there's that same type of uh, very quick uh, disclosure requirement under SFTR, which, you know, could be, could be very interesting from, a, from, you know, a ticker tape type of, uh, type of analogy like you gave, Jim, but the question is how practical will it be and, you know, what type of operational or other changes might market participants have to put in place to be able to adhere to that type of a very rapid disclosure requirement. I don't know, Josh, if you wanted to add to that. 
Um, yeah, I could add that the level of public disclosure is, is greatly advanced in the SEC proposal compared to Europe's SFTR. In fact, it's not even on the same scale. In Europe, uh, trade repositories release a report once a week on the amount of securities financing transactions that have been conducted. The data are not comparable to any other data source. They really only are reflective of themselves. And they're definitely not at, a, at the granular security level. Uh, the US, uh, the SEC proposal would provide at the latest, let's, let's presume T plus one transparency on utilization uh, and lending activity on a name basis. That's uh, it's a huge difference. Yeah, and I'll just, I'll hop in on there too. You know, I think we won't beat a dead horse on the 15 minutes versus, you know, T plus one. But um, one thing I think that's important um, to talk about here too is in the goal of increasing transparency and securities lending, not conflating that with actual short sales, um, you know, with the focus here being GME potentially, and that's at least in, in some of the retail eyes, some of the problems, you know, securities lending happens on T plus two after a short sale is done and it can happen, you know, multiple times over to cover a short. And so, um, you know, this data being reported in 15 minutes, some of it being disseminated in real time around that and the SEC reference signals in their report, um, can either be helpful or actually kind of be, you know, make things a little more confusing for the market. So I think um, there's certainly a lot more information in here as, as Laura and Josh alluded to. And, you know, I think the big question is timeliness, but also making sure of what the reporting is actually tackling um, and, and what's behind a securities lending transaction versus a short sale is a big difference. Definitely a big difference. But uh, how is this going to change the securities lending industry? Because obviously, uh, Transparency often has big impacts, and I'm curious, uh, uh, what do you all think that it will actually, how do you think it will change the industry? So I'll, I'll give it a shot to start. Um, I think there's probably some pluses and minuses in, and again, using Josh's words to look at it in its current form. Um, so transparency can be beneficial um, certainly, uh, you know, some people may want to understand better what their shares are being lent out for, or what rates are going for to make decisions either directly because they're a lender, or maybe you're a trader in another market and you need to better understand that. Now there's resources for that available today, um, through third-party vendors as the SEC mentioned in the rule. Um, so, you know, what you could see is, is tighter, or I, I would say smaller variants around, different rates every day. But again, we have to go back to the subjective nature of borrows and loans and that some borrows may be more stable than others and you're willing to pay more. Um, you know, where I, I do worry um, where this could hinder things is operationally, um, while most firms are up to speed with SFTR and vendors can support that. I and mean, if we think, you know, Howard can certainly chime in on cat reporting, which was a big lift, um, is how much does the operational impact slow down maybe other developments in the market, whether it's technology or Laura's program and possibly reduce the ability of new participants to enter because they're trying to comply with these types of rules. And so um, trying to find that right balance is obviously important, but I, I think that from, from our perspective is a big concern um, in terms of wanting to get more participants and participants in the market. And if you give them information to act, but it's harder to comply operationally, we may be back where we started. I agree with Matt. I think the operational hurdles for the industry uh, will be significant enough with this uh, regulation, with this proposal, um, that it will distract from other priorities and other opportunities. That could really move the industry forward much further, much faster. As far as changes to the industry from this kind of proposal for securities lending, core market participants, I don't think there's going to be much change at all. Um, the SEC has talked about this database being cleaner or um, more comprehensive. I don't actually think that it will be uh, from public disclosure. That means that industry participants will continue to keep their relationships with existing data vendors. The data that they see are gonna be a, a mashup of all sorts of lending activity. So for uh, larger institutional players, no change. I think there'll be some significant changes on the retail side. For example, uh, lenders in fully paid securities lending programs will have reference points and be able to argue with their brokers about why they got this rate or that. Uh, that won't be fun for brokers. Um, and uh, it, I think it's gonna cause a lot of confusion. I like to give the example of uh, securities loans are sort of like home loans. 
as opposed to trades. And I think it's very easy for many investors and regulators as well, for that matter, to think about securities lending like a trade on an equity market where there's one price, you're done, that's the print. That's not how it happens. How would the market react, for example, if there was a ticker of home loans all across the country where there was no information about where the loan was made, uh, what the credit background of the borrower was, uh, or how long the trade was for? As a result, you would get this ticker of sort of random numbers that comes out. And whether the ultimate result is that the uh, data in the SEC proposal are released every 15 minutes or T plus one, I think there's gonna be a lot of difficulty in comprehension. Yeah. <clears throat> Yeah. Matt, you mentioned uh, CAT for the industry, so I'm going to put Howard on the spot here as our data expert. Uh, is this more like the consolidated audit trail, or is it more like the uh, trace for bonds? How, how would you sort of put this in terms of uh, you know, level of uh, uh, burden on uh, the industry just from a cost and process perspective? Yes, that, that's a great question. And in terms of the type of data that has to be reported, it's transaction data. So in that way, it's, and meaning execution data. So in that way, it's, it's very similar to trace reporting where you're reporting bond trades. And it's very similar to TRF and ORF reporting where you're reporting equity trades, as opposed to a CAT where you're reporting all order events. So there's a much greater complexity in that on the other hand, what makes this very complex is that it's not, uh, you know, CAT had a predecessor, which was OATS, which was 20 years old. So there was a lot to build on uh, with that. And CAT was essentially an advancement of OATS. Whereas here with securities lending, we're really starting from scratch with a, a new reporting system. And so I think a lot of the challenges will be uh, what data is available, the different uh, transaction types, uh, you know, for example, maybe lending to third parties through like a, a lending system, it's going to be more easy to report that. It might be harder for firms in terms of their internal lending, trying to figure out how to report that. So these are issues that are uh, that our working group is going through, and we're still very early in the process. And I think, you know, this comment letter time period, I just, I want to make a comment on this. It's, it's 30 days. But from our perspective, it's really 15 days because as an industry group, you know, we don't want to have calls when half the members are out the last two weeks. You know, a lot of firms or, you know, people are on their two week a year mandated bank holidays. And uh, so from our perspective, it's really a 15 day comment period. And we're, we're not planning to submit a comment letter by January 7. If we do, it might be something limited, uh, but this is really complex. It's really important that the industry members have time and not just, industry, but all market participants have time to carefully review this proposal because uh, you know what we've seen with CAT and some other systems, once it's adopted, the, there's so much complexity that has to be dealt, dealt with. And it's so much better to catch those issues up front now during the comment period. And uh, this is not the only comment period that's just been opened up. This week, the SEC has put out many other proposals. Uh, I consider them uh, uh, Christmas presents for regulatory geeks like me who reads those things for entertainment. But I know uh, not everybody views them that way. And uh, <clears throat> anyways, Josh mentioned uh, the opportunity cost of this. Given limited technical bandwidth uh, in the industry, uh, this is uh, you know, clearly resources devoted to this are probably gonna slow down some other initiatives. And I'm just curious, which other initiatives do you think uh, you know, might be delayed or permanently derailed by the resources put into this? Yeah, I'd mention three in particular. Uh, one is, as Laura and Matt are working on, adoption of the CCP in the US. I think the uh, NSCC SFT CCP offers a lot of promise. But if uh, market participants now have to invest 375 million as per the SEC proposal in this new data platform, that's gonna take away a lot of effort there. Um, the second is around data analytics. 
So uh, firms have done a lot of work in the last few years in upgrading their data analytics, and that's especially important for post-trade processing, uh, creating more efficiency and, and more straight through processing around securities finance. And lastly, our efforts around blockchain, which are really just beginning. A number of firms have demonstration projects. There are some active vendors in the space now, and they're doing really interesting work. I think with the SEC proposal, the uh, ability of some firms to focus on blockchain or distributed ledger technology projects will be delayed. Uh, what about uh, T plus one? You know, the industry seems to be working in that direction. Uh, do any of you think that uh, that's going to hamper some of the efforts to get T plus one operational? Well, I'll, I'll kind of defer to Laura on that one, but I, I think just generally, you know, that's that's one that we stare at a lot too, because that's that's an operational lift um, in and of itself. We, you know, we went from T plus three to T plus two. Um, you know, as I think about how this can kind of be more symbiotic with hopefully the success of the CCP, you can start to layer in, you know, securities lending through the CCP tied in with T plus one, which actually becomes much more operationally efficient, balance sheet efficient. Um, but if they're working in silos and needing to build out reporting mechanisms at, at extreme cost, what you, you know, what I think, again, just kind of to beat a dead horse here and, and talking about, you know, a little bit about swap rules that are coming out that I think are, are necessary, but also looking forward is how can we use technology, people's strengths in the industry and our ability to partner easier with the technology environment um, to push things forward, but also bring in newer participants so that it's not just the same, you know, 100 participants or 125 participants. But if I, you know, I'll let Laura speak more on it, but Fix sponsored repo is a perfect example, right? 2,000 participants or so versus what was a decade, you know, I, I don't know the number, but obviously very fractional of that. Um, all these things can work in concert to strengthen market structure without necessarily beating, you know, down the burden of reporting. Yeah, well, I, I, I completely agree. And, and certainly T plus one is, is its own very, you know, worthwhile effort. And it's a collaboration, I would argue, between the industry and the regulators and something the community, you know, all is, is working very hard to achieve. Um, I completely agree with Matt that there are a whole lot of synergies between clearing stock loan um, and also moving to T plus one. And certainly that's, you know, we spend a lot of time talking to the clients about how those two, how those two um, work streams can, can work in tandem. But I think Josh and, and Matt are right that this, you know, the more um, priorities that uh, an institution or a firm has to place on regulatory requirements, the less the um, voluntary or elective um, offerings, uh, you know, resources that they have to devote to those. I mean, that's just reality. You know, we saw that happen with SFTR. Certainly that was, you know, a major lift for the industry. And a lot of firms had to say, you know, say, this is my top priority. I cannot do anything else, you know, elective or, you know, to advance my business forward until, you know, I'm able to comply with SFTR. So I think it will be something that that has to be reckoned with. Um, certainly, you know, one of the things I was going to point out is that we have a lot of open questions ourselves on, on the proposal as to what the role of a clearing agency might be. Um, in terms of, of reporting, um, I don't think it's entirely clear, the proposal, because it talks about clearing agencies um, acting as lending agents. Um, that's not something that I, I know of any clearing agency that does. Um, we are um, central counterparties. We provide novation, guarantee, and settlement services. We don't, you know, source borrowers or negotiate rates in the way that a, a typical agent lender would do. So, you know, we have some open questions ourselves as to, you know, what the reporting obligation of a clearing agency might be under, under the proposal um, and or would that be duplicative with the requirements that the end lender might, might have themselves. So, you know, there's a lot of ambiguity on that front. I think we're also thinking to ourselves, um, if we have a reporting requirement, do we actually have the data that we need um, to be able to, to comply, you know, certainly, you know, and this is one of the points I was going to raise is that um, in the agent, you know, clearing agent lender clearing model, um, we're expecting agent lenders to lend on an on, omnibus block basis in the central in the central counterparty, as opposed to individual beneficial owners lending individually. So we may not 
at the CCP level actually have the information on the underlying beneficial owners that's required under the reporting. That's another point, uh, you know, we're thinking about and, um, you know, and then practically, you know, we, since we sort of had the SFTR experience previously, um, in my fixed income clearing corporation business, uh, we actually had some activity that was covered by that regulation. So, it, you know, we're European counterparties, we're participants in repo at FICC. And we actually thought about potentially offering some reporting services into SFTR. But what came out of that discussion was that because not all of the covered activity was going to be centrally cleared, that it really made more sense for market participants to consolidate the reporting into a third party vendor that could amalgamate and do the reporting, um, not just on the cleared activity, but on all the uncleared activity. And I suspect that the industry will go through some sort of similar analysis with this proposed rulemaking if it moves forward. You know, on the other hand, if the uh, <clears throat> final rule is crafted properly, um, it might be, you might be able to provide a very uh, uh, seamless solution if you could be the reporting entity. You know, they give you all the details they need for you to do central clearing and you do the reporting, but uh, that remains to be seen. Now, yeah, I think it'll depend upon what the scope of the cleared offerings are versus what has to be reported, but uh, totally agree. Yeah. Now, uh, speaking of uh, <clears throat> you know, opportunity costs, what are some of the other unintended consequences that uh, might uh, come from uh, you know, this uh, proposal? So I, I think, you know, from our perspective, and, and Josh talked about this a little bit, um, but going back to the subjective nature, but also just the way this market works is that people are getting, if, if we go as it currently stands in real time, um, some of the information that you might receive is not really what the, the ultimate end result will be. And I'll give you a very basic example that we all know in the securities lending market, you could pen out a loan now and might not make settlement until the end of the day. And that would get reported at 15 minutes. There's a chance that could drop and fail. Now, I think that goes back to a market structure benefit of hopefully what you know, Laura and, and our firm is working on in terms of making sure trades are matched and locked in. And part of our goal going through the ATS process with the SEC and FINRA process in this con in conjunction to this was to be able to put a framework to, to ensure hopefully more kind of stable market practices. And there's some participants out there um, who, who take pride in their timeliness of their delivery. And, and some are just operationally burdened with being able to do that. But you could get a scenario where a trade is lent, on lent, on lent, ultimately fails, and you have three reported trades during the day that drop at the end of the day. So that's just kind of one kind of microcosm of the subjectivity and, and the quirky nature of this market, where I think real-time reporting may lead to kind of, um, you know, if people are using that as signals or whatever, um, you know, decision-making that isn't entirely complete ahead of time. But, uh, and you mentioned the quirkiness of the market in end of day. So Matt, with your experience, uh, you know, trading sec lending, um, where, where do you see most of the activity taking place during the day? Where norm most of us are used to normal trading hours from you know, 9.30 to four with little bits of stuff before and after. So can you enlighten the audience as to the, you know, the workflow implications for you know, the sec lending market? When does, when does the, the actual uh, activity take place? Yeah, sure. So um, as you mentioned earlier, you know, we can bucket, I would say, the market and, and Laura, Josh, Howard chime in here, but into two pieces, GC, general collateral, which is relatively commoditized names, Apple, IBM, et cetera, um, and harder to borrow ones. And, and I think in the course of a day, normally what you would have is a batch process that gets done overnight and the needs for the morning of the GC names. And if a firm is relatively automated, they can kind of spit that out. Hopefully they can use an ATS or in the CCP and that all works, but um, everybody has, you know, their, their, their touch points for the market. Um, and that gets done fairly quickly and hopefully settled, you know, in relative due course, um, just because of, as I said, that there's an imbalance in the market, right? There's 25, 30 trillion of lendable assets and let's call it a, a trillion on loan at any given time in the US, maybe a little less. Um, and then as you go throughout the day, the harder to borrow ones become more of the asset that people search for. You have 1130, which is a cutoff for returning trades. Um, and then the afternoon becomes an exercise in kind of probably 
finding things that pop up, looking for hard to borrows, trading arbitrage opportunities that then spills into the synthetic market swaps options, which is, you know, again, kind of what we're trying to build here, but I think it is an important topic to touch on as well, um, because there are some corollaries into those markets. And, you know, as over the last 20 years, I would say um, securities lending swaps and option trading for financing used to be bucketed and they're starting to kind of merge together. And so I think, you know, the ability for people to find those harder to borrow securities via different methods is becoming more and more prevalent. Thank you. Now, uh, let's get back to the whole transparency question. What kind of transparency should the SEC be doing? You know, if, uh, if you were a commissioner and you had this congressional mandate to do something with respect to transparency, what do you think it ought to look like? I have more to say here than we have time, um, but I'm going to be very <laughs> brief. So to start with, um, the SEC has focused on transparency from the data reporting perspective and has not been looking at all about market structure or not that we know of, and definitely not in this proposal. Uh, there's a lot of changes that could be made, improvements that could be made to the securities lending market through a focus on market structure that could in turn result in more transparency. I'm gonna stop right there because we could go on. Oh uh, yeah. <laughs> another important point is that the actual transparency that I think they're gonna get here is not what they intend. Uh, the fact that they intend to keep the identity of the lender private, which is appropriate. Um, and as the proposal is currently written, there's no flag or other identifying information that would say, this is a loan between a mutual fund and a prime broker or this is a loan between two retail brokers, that sort of thing, means that the actual data that's gonna come out, the SEC will be the only entity that will have that kind of uh, bucketing or pooling information and be able to actually work with the data from any kind of benchmark or market analytics perspective. The rest of the market is gonna see the data. They're gonna see a bunch of numbers lumped together that uh, are, are not differentiated based on the important factors of collateral credit um, or term and they're gonna walk away, except for retail investors as we discussed. So I, I think that the proposal has promise. I think it could be adjusted to provide greater transparency and deliver more of an impact, positive impact for the market, but it does not in the current way that it's structured. Are there other comments on what should the SEC be doing here? I. I I think, you know, in terms of reporting and data, I don't know that this necessarily falls in that bucket. Um, but, you know, going back to Josh's point about market structure, if, you know, drilling down on one, one area, um, I think, you know, taking a look at locates um, has always been kind of a, a sore point for us um, as a company uh, and where we think, you know, things can work. And for the audience, you know, locate is what you get before you enact a short sale. Um, and if we think about how fast the cash equity markets move versus what, you know, kind of the source material is for locates, um, I think that is, an, you know, just one example of, of the market structure bucket um, that can improve and help this, you know, overall, you know, whether concerns or, or stability of the securities lending market and, and complementary markets. Um, and so, you know, I would like to see a larger conversation about more market structure along with what Laura and DTC are doing. Um, as ways that we can do this organically. Now, who are the winners and losers? Uh, you know, Josh has definitely mentioned uh, that uh, you know, little retail people like me will have more fun things to complain to our brokers about. Um, I'm sure that the uh, regulatory specialists, uh, the compliance companies, uh, you know, this is <clears throat> all the Activities from the SEC are definitely a full employment act for um, compliance professionals. Um, who, are the, who are the other winners here? Um, is there gonna be any net benefit to the uh, actual beneficial owners? As a consultant to beneficial owners, I'll say no. I think the data will be too jumbled. And I think that the data providers, the, and there are three large data providers in this market already, do a very good job with both the data they collect, cleaning the data and delivering reporting on the data. Uh, as the proposal is currently structured, I, I just can't see beneficial owners turning to, to this new data source coming from FINRA 
as a reliable benchmarking tool. So what would have to be done to this proposal to make it reliable? We're talking about clean data. Um, so that means being able to benchmark against the type of institution that's doing the lending, uh, type of collateral that's being lent or being received rather. Um, those are the two big ones. If those two were fixed, I think that there could be, could be some interesting opportunity here. The other big issue though is on lending. So right now, uh, the, the proposal as I've read it, uh, you have to report within 15 minutes, then you have to report modifications. There's a unique trade identifier that FINRA will need to create and then send back potentially to the submitter. I'm not quite clear about all that flow. Um, so within all that, there's all the activities between the lender and borrower of the initial transaction, but then there are cases in securities lending where a loan is made and then the same securities are then lent onwards to another company. How will the SEC track that or how will FINRA track that? If you don't track that, then it could make it appear that the amount of securities lending activity going on is uh, a real multiple of the actual number. Um, you could get situations where uh, someone who doesn't know what's going on could say, oh, look, the amount of securities loans that were made was 140% uh, of the float. Well, no, that's not right. But I think that that's a conversation that we should expect if the proposal is not modified and really tightened up to be tracking all these, these different elements of the data. Thank you. Yeah, I can say as currently proposed, you would have that double, you would have that multiple reporting. And I, I agree that is an issue that definitely should be looked at. Now, uh, in the few minutes we have left, I would like to open it up uh, to the general audience for Q&A. So uh, if any of the audience members have uh, a question or comment, please put it in the chat window. I see that Michael Decker asked, uh, does the proposal uh, cover fixed income as well as equities? Uh, yes, it does. It covers any kind of securities. And uh, indeed, it, as I read it, it sounds like it would even cover uh, crypto securities in the so-called DeFi space. So uh, it is uh, basically, it's not just for NMS equities. It would also cover the over-the-counter market, fixed income, and anything that looks like a security to our friends at the Securities Exchange Commission. The uh, Pat Conroy is asking, what about pay to hold or borrow? Who wants to take that one? Is that relevant here? So I'll, I'll take a stab at what I think Pat's trying to get at in terms of pay to hold. But so for the broader audience, pay to hold would be that you go to a lender and say, I need this. It's hard to borrow security. I want to make sure that I can borrow it on T plus two because I'm enacting a short sale and I'm willing to pay you to hold it for me for the next two days until I need to make delivery um, or versus just borrowing it and keeping it on your own balance sheet. If that's what Pat's getting at, um, you know, in the latter scenario, you would have the lender reporting on, on trade date, which goes back to maybe, you know, that's a kind of perfect scenario of that is accurate reporting of short sale covering relative to a short sale, but you wouldn't have the T plus two. So you'd have a little lag there on pay to hold. I don't think it would be covered by the rule at all um, in, until the actual loan is in, enacted on you know T plus two or, or whenever they agree to make delivery. And Matt, you bring up a very interesting issue and that is where does where and when does the price discovery actually take place in the stock loan market? That uh, is that at the you know, pay to uh, hold or pay to borrow stage, or uh, is it at the locate stage, or is it mostly on uh, T plus two? So that's a, as Josh would say, that's a that's a bit of a loaded question there, uh, Jim. But uh, we'll we'll just uh, assume that the bulk of the time, um, you know, for GC, if you get a locate, you kind of have a rough idea of what what you're borrowing. Um, but as we saw in GameStop, right. Um, something that can look maybe warm or hard to borrow can come very scarce uh, quickly. Um, again, we'll, you know, I'll save my rants on the locate process uh, for now, but, um, you know, I think that's where, you know, that price discovery as you get into harder to borrow securities. Um, that's why pay to hold exists. I don't think it happens as frequently um, in this case that would be relevant, but, it, you know, in that scenario, you want to make sure that you know your rate and that that has implications for, let's say a vol trader who needs to price out a trade on vol, but needs to know what his interest is going to be. 
um, rather than wondering, okay, it's close to, it's available. And then I'll just figure out the rate, you know, two days later, which could blow up the whole trade. So, um, you know, that's an important uh, distinction there. Um, I don't think it's as prevalent, but it could be with some market structure changes. Interesting. And Jonathan Steinberg is asking, what are your thoughts on the availability reporting? That's the once a day reporting of the quantities uh, available. I think it's going to be tricky. I think it's a doable thing, but I think it would be a good uh, move for the SEC to tighten up the rules to make explicit about what available really means. For example, you could say that there's a trillion dollars if a fund participates in a securities lending program, but under US rules for a mutual fund, they can only lend a third of their securities. Does that mean that every security is available? Probably not. Uh, there, there are technicalities here. I, I don't think that if you just say available and throw it into a big pot, I don't know that that's gonna to get to the right accurate number that regulators really would like to see. Yeah. We had, um, we've had some members raise the issue of if you're an institution and you make securities available maybe to a limited number of counterparties or you make it available to a wider number of counterparties, at what point, or you'll make it available under certain conditions, market conditions, at what point does that become available to land or not? And you could end up with different institutions reporting differently, which you don't want because that certainly uh, would really, the data would not be valuable at that point. And if you're going to just over report, is it even a meaningless, is it even a meaningful number? Can you even, can a meaningful uh, definition be provided that's going to be helpful to the industry? Or is it just going to be an over reporting number and under reporting? And, and I think that's a big question about whether that's even a, a worthwhile stat to have in this, in this type of uh, report. And of course, there are all the issues as to uh, how will uh, FINRA actually audit this when they come around and enforce it. Now, one of the questions that comes up in the proposal is, should reporting be done only by FINRA members or can non-FINRA members report? And I'm wondering uh, what your thoughts are on that. You know, I mean, I think that, go ahead. I'm sorry, go, you go ahead, Howard. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to. I mean, I think it is, FINRA is really a, you know, in addition to their regulatory specialty, you know, they only regulate broker dealers, they do have a lot of expertise in terms of reporting because of their experience with Trace and with TRF and ORF, which is more of a, it's not just a regulatory function, it's really a, a reporting operational type uh, expertise that they have but they only regulate broker dealers. So it's not an ideal situation that way because like with Trace reporting today, you have broker dealers that are reporting their treasury trades to, tra to uh, Trace, but bank, uh, bank dealers that are not broker dealers are not reporting. So that's, that's a regulatory arbitrage there and, and the Federal Reserve is looking to address that. So I think you have to have, everyone has to report for this to be a fair system and I don't see why you have to be a broker dealer to report, but we're definitely, that's another set of issues that we're definitely focused on. Yeah, I, I was basically gonna make the same point is that, you know, I, I suspect that probably the intent was for the reporting to be done by a regulated entity that's subject to the SEC supervision, but there are other types of regulated entities and, and uh, I think I agree with Howard that it probably isn't the most efficient for it to be limited to broker dealers as you know potential delegated reporting parties. Thank you. I think there's a lot of fintechs out there that could do it. I think CCPs could do it as well. Um, <clears throat> Sorry, one other point that came up in our discussions is that they should the the rules should more clearly define. Who has the regulatory re obligation to report? Like who's responsible if the report is incorrect versus who will mechanically do the report? So a vendor who's not a broker dealer should be able to mechanically be the one to have that connection and actually physically do the reporting. But if they're not a regulated entity, they wouldn't have, and they're not the lender, they would not have the regulatory responsibility. So those two things should be clearly differentiated in the rule. 
Definitely. Now, uh, we're almost out of time, but uh, Eric Lytle uh, has uh, an interesting question about the uh, availability reporting. And he said it might help with locate issues. Um, should it be intraday as well as once a day? That uh, should there be intraday availability reporting mandated to be used as locates? So, well, since I've commented on that, I'll, I'll, I'll jump in on there a little bit. But uh, yeah, I think Howard makes a good point that broadly just a, an amalgamation of all the availability is, is a large number and there's probably not a lot to do with that. I think to Eric's question, and this is where we as a, as a firm take a stance, um, you know, for the, for the viewers listening, the current rule is that, you know, using availability based on a 24 hour old or less list is vital or is available to be located. Um, I think there's firms that are updating that in real time. And like we mentioned earlier, you know, you have cash equity markets trading in milliseconds and there's firms that are constantly calculating their box and, and doing the calculations for 15 C3 or other and know what they have in real time and putting that out. And it's the growth, hopefully, of, of platforms and marketplaces. That'll be more and more in real time. And I think we should use that as an, a, as an addendum to now, actually not an addendum, but a beginning part here where, you know, you can use that information more accurately to give locates in real time. So if, for example, a GME trades up 400% and 10 times ADV, that availability picture is probably going to look a lot different than it did 24 hours ago if you have real time updating. Thank you. Well, unfortunately, we're out of time. Uh, there's a lot more we could be talking about. I know that uh, some of you have to jump to another session right now. I want to you know, thank all of our panelists uh, for an excellent discussion. And I want to thank all of the attendees for helping make this possible. And uh, with that, uh, we'll call it a day. And uh, I wish you all a wonderful afternoon.